But we'll come to the time in our service now. We're going to look at a passage from the Bible. We're going to talk about what it means, why this matters, and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible with you, would you turn to the book of Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. If you're using this Brown Pew Bible, it's on page 474. And when you found that, would you stand together, and I'll read uh, this passage for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, continuing in our series through the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon says this, And I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Again, this word meaningless is this Hebrew word hebel, meaning, uh, translated here as meaningless, but just meaning mist, vapor, or breath. Verse 5, The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one. Because they have good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. Pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us once more and just ask God's blessing now on this time in his word. Spirit of God, we come now to your word believing that this is a living word, that you uh, wrote this, inspired this to be written by men centuries ago, and yet because it was inspired by your spirit, it is a word that still speaks today. This is not some ancient document, but a living word that you want to speak through and that you tell us very clearly. You say when you send out this word... It doesn't return to you void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you send it out. God, I'm asking you to accomplish that purpose in each one of us here today. And as I always ask, eternal God, now would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth. Amen. Well, it was in the summer of 2013 that I embarked on one of the most challenging experiences of my life. This is where I tried to assemble an entire Ikea bunk bed set entirely on my own. Yeah. Now, I've made no secret of the fact over the years that I have something of a love-hate relationship with Ikea furniture, Uh, that being that I love the price and hate pretty much everything else about it. Uh, I I, I hate uh, having to find the product in this sea of identical-looking cardboard boxes on the shelf. I hate how those carts don't actually go straight, and I can't maneuver around those aisles with all the people. Uh, I I hate trying to fit random-sized boxes into my car. But what I hate most of all is the assembly process. The assembly process, it just, it, it makes me go to dark places in my heart. But now... Now, here I was. This is no longer, a, you know, a cute particle board side table or, or shelves that can barely hold the weight of a coffee cup. Now, this is an entire set of bunk beds that we're putting together. And after hours of laboring to put this thing together and, and a balancing with the thing, trying to put it by myself, it looked like something out of Cirque du Soleil, I don't know what. Eventually, I came to the realization that I should have known from the beginning. I needed the help of another person. This work was not intended to be completed on my own. Now, I would love to tell you that this was just an isolated uh, example, but unfortunately, my family attends this church, and they can tell you otherwise. Uh, I do this kind of thing all the time, whether this is uh, trying to carry in all the groceries from the car at one trip, uh, whether it's trying to deal with sin issues on my own throughout the years, Whatever it is, somehow it seems I always need to get stuck first before I realize, oh yeah, I I need the help of other people. I should have asked for help with that. First problem is, I mean, it's just inefficient. It it increases the likelihood of being injured like a thousand times. But 
The much deeper problem, doing things on our own, is that it's contrary to the way God designed us. It's easy to miss, but if you look in the creation account described for us in the book of Genesis, when God is adding human beings into the mix, he very clearly says, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. In our likeness, which means we're made in the image and likeness of a God who, among other things, lives in perfect, eternal, unbroken community within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it means we're, we're hardwired for community. From the most extreme extrovert you know to the most committed introvert and everything in between, we are hardwired for community. It means we need each other. We're designed to need each other. And yet, since the entry of sin into the world, the fall in Genesis chapter 3, in one way or another, every single one of us regularly still tries to live in denial of that reality, living in ways that are contrary to our design need for community, even as we continue to long for it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and theologian living during, in Nazi Germany in 1939 during the Second World War. And it was at that time he published his now famous book, Life Together. Maybe some of you have read this, which was essentially a treatise on Christian community and how that's connected to our image-bearing of God. In that treatise, he wrote this. We are members of a body, not only when we choose to be, but in our whole existence. Every member serves the whole body either to its health or to its destruction. This is no mere theory. It is a spiritual reality. And the Christian community has often experienced its effects with disturbing clarity, sometimes destructively and sometimes fortunately, which is ultimately just reminding us we are designed for community whether we like it or not. And there are consequences that result when we seek to live contrary to that design. We're continuing our series this morning through the book of Ecclesiastes called A Chasing After the Wind. And although it was written centuries before a guy like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, King Solomon, who is the author of Ecclesiastes, is going to tell us almost the exact same thing as it relates to our designed need for community, as well as the ways we destroy that community when we seek to live contrary to our relational design. And to understand why God would make us that way, as well as to see what Solomon has to say about how we can avoid patterns of thinking and behavior that destroy community, I want to look at our passage this morning just two ways. I want to show you three hindrances to community, and then finally, three pictures of true community. Three hindrances to community, three pictures of true community. That's what we're going to see in our passage this morning. So if you've closed your Bibles, would you open them up again to that same passage, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, follow along with me as we look at Solomon's own treaties of our life together under the sun. So let's look first of all at three hindrances to community. Three hindrances to community. So again, the teaching of the Bible is that all human beings are made in the image of likeness of God and that that triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in whose image we've been created, is an infinitely relational God, which means we were designed for relationship and community with each other, and we were also designed for relationship and community with God. And we had that. We had that relationship and community with each other and with God for all of about two chapters of the Bible story before sin enters the world through Adam and Eve's sin and that community was lost. And in the first four verses of our passage, what Solomon is doing here essentially is giving us descriptions, three descriptions of behaviors that we still practice today that are contrary to a design and bring about a continued loss of that community. Now, I know you may not see or recognize yourself in all of his descriptions, but you'll very likely uh, see yourself in at least one of them. So watch closely with an open mind and an open heart. And the behaviors he describes as hindrances to community that I see are as follows. Domination, disengagement, and then deprivation. 
domination, disengagement, deprivation. Let's look first of all at domination. We see that in verse 4. Look with me there. Solomon says, And I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. Now Solomon's already gone to great lengths in previous chapters to show how our work, our toil, it is a good gift from God. It's something to be enjoyed as long as we're not looking to it to find meaning and purpose that can only be found in God. It is a good gift. But, of course, in a world stained and broken by sin, even good things can become harmful things. So, what we see is that what he's describing here is a way in which we can pour ourselves into our work now, striving after all these achievements, not for the sake of enjoying God's good gift of work. Not for the sake of enjoying the benefits that we all receive as a result of that work in our days under the sun, but because of this, because we look around us and we see what our neighbor has and we want the same or better for ourselves. Envy, we we look on our achievements and the, the, the things around us that others have with envy. And his commentary on Ecclesiastes, Derek Kidner says it this way. There's lots of different exceptions to this rule, but he says this, but the fact remains, all too much of our hard work and our high endeavor is mixed with the craving to outshine or to not be outshone. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that this behavior is only stoked and and fueled at an even greater level in this world that we live in today, right? The prevalence of social media in the hands of everyone from grandma to grandchild It's everywhere. We have uh, an access to compare our stuff with everybody else's stuff in a way that somebody in Solomon's age couldn't have even dreamed of having. So what this looks like now is rather than just living out our days under the sun, being content with what we have, we live in a constant state of envy, a constant state of uh, competition with everyone, uh, or I'm trying to dominate over everyone else around me, including those who are closest to me. So so it looks like this. I mean, I, I, I don't just buy another pair of shoes because one is worn out and I have the blessing of being able to buy a new pair. No, no, no. Now I have to buy that pair of shoes with, with that label on it because, you know, I got to have my, my, my Fluvogs, I got to have my Manola Blahnik, whatever it is, I've got to have these shoes because... They've got to be matching or better than the shoes that I see all my friends have. I've got to be able to show up to work or class on Monday morning. People will be like, whoa, your shoes are amazing. And so the cycle continues. Or I, I no longer exercise. I no longer work out because I want to be healthy and steward the body God's given me. Now I need to work, slave, starve myself, maybe surgically alter myself because I need to look like the Facebook, Instagram pictures of my neighbor's vacation. Man, they look incredible. I need to, I got to do something. I can't just enjoy, be healthy. No, 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 that's not good enough anymore. It's a competition. It's keeping up with the Joneses gone wild. But can we just be honest with each other this morning and acknowledge and agree that competition like that is devastating to community? That you can't really be in community with those who you're trying to dominate, right? Right? Stephen Myers said it this way, if companionship, by which he would include community, relationship, if companionship is true good, then labor that alienates oneself can only impoverish no matter what the material gain may be. So that's what domination looks like, a constant state of envy and competition. If you look at verse 5 now, we see the next hindrance to community, disengagement. Solomon writes this, the fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Now, I don't know if it was a politically correct day at the office when the New International Version translators were working on this, but when you look at the original Greek text, this is how this verse comes across. It says, the fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. That's a little bit more striking, isn't it? Devours himself. Or again, as Kidner puts it, this man's idleness eats away not only at what he has, but who he is. And we've already seen it. Solomon, he likes to do comparative analysis, right? When he's looking at stuff during his study of everything under the sun, 
He likes to look at both sides of what he's trying to examine. So here, what he's presenting is simply the opposite end of the spectrum, from the guy who's working like crazy to meet or exceed the standards of what he sees his neighbor has, to now describing a guy who couldn't care less, he couldn't be bothered to meet the standards of anyone. He doesn't care. It's a guy who, no matter what, no matter what you invite him to, no matter what you ask him to help serve in, include him in, his response is always, man, no, I don't know. No, you know what? No, I'm going to be super busy at that time. I got all kinds of stuff. I got stuff I got to work on, so no, I'm not going to make it. No, no, I don't, I don't think I can do it. No, no, I'm busy that time. Or if they do come to the things, if they do come to that work day, that, that event, whatever it is, they just sit off in the back corner on their phone the whole time, earbuds in, just not engaging with anyone, and then they leave after the lunch break. I mean, do you have any idea how difficult it is, how impossible it is to build community with someone as disengaged as that? Disengagement is deadly to community. Why? Because true, deep community, where you're really doing life together, takes work. It takes effort. It takes willingness to be vulnerable and get your hands dirty. And in the end, what Solomon is saying here is the disengaged person is not only deadly to community, they're deadly to themselves. That figuratively speaking, they devour themselves as a result of their disengagement from community. Finally, the last hindrance to community Solomon lists we see in verse 8. Look with me there. He writes this. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? Here Solomon describes the one who deprives himself. Deprives himself of community. Listen, not because there's not people around them. There are people around them. But because they're so inwardly focused, so inwardly driven, that they make no time, they make no space in order to connect deeply with anyone. You look at the first half of verse 8, Solomon's description there of this man's aloneness. It's very telling. You see what he says? He says, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. Now, if you just don't have a son or a brother, does that mean you're alone? No. Do you know what that means? It means this man very likely is married and does have a family. What he doesn't have is a son. He doesn't have an heir, a son, or a brother to pass on all his stuff to. That's why he's saying, asking this question, for whom am I toiling? It sounds very much like what Solomon said a few weeks ago when he, he, he tested work to see whether or not it could give him meaning and purpose. And then found that all he had worked for, one day he'd have to hand it over to someone who who hadn't worked for it and wouldn't appreciate it. I think the enjoyment he speaks of depriving himself of there in the second half of verse 8 is just simply deep connection with his family. Why did he deprive himself? Well, the middle of verse 8 tells us plainly, because he pursued wealth like a madman, but it was never enough for him. It was never enough. He was that billionaire who, when asked the question of how much money is enough, his answer was always just a little bit more, just a little bit. To be unhappy at home, said Samuel Johnson, is the ultimate result of ambition. And when you deprive yourself of community, of family, of friends, of your church family, because you just don't have the time. I can't, can't, can't make that. No, I can't, no, can't do that. You truly are alone. And you also leave those longing for community with you alone as well. Now, thinking about that is difficult enough already. I wonder how many of you recognized yourself in any of those descriptions of behaviors and attitudes that hinder community. I know I did. But there's something that makes this all even more confusing and difficult because, listen, every single one of those people I just described there that Solomon is writing about here still wants community, still wants relationship. They still want it even as they're acting in ways that destroy it and make it impossible. Because, remember, we're designed that way. We're designed to want it. We're designed to need it. But the common thread that you see weaving itself through each one of those hindrances to community is also the solution to regaining it. 
We see it in verse 6. Look back with me there. Solomon says this, Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Do you know what that means? It means the problem causing community to be lost, as well as the solution to regaining community, all centers around one thing, contentment. Contentment. I mean, what is one handful as opposed to two? Well, it's one less than two handfuls, but it's also one more than none. It's just enough. Jeremiah Burroughs said it this way, We think that contentment means raising up our possessions to the level of our desires. True contentment is found, he said, when a man can bring his desires down to his possessions. That's how we truly find contentment. Think about it. That the man who deprives himself of community does so because he's never content with what he has. The man who disengages from community does so because he's not content with what other people have. And the man who deprives himself and disengages from community, he is content, but he's content with what he shouldn't be content with. Contentment is both the problem and the solution to lost community. Which, if you're here this morning and you truly are feeling disconnected, isolated, left out. There's all kinds of reasons that could happen. But it should lead us, given all this, to at least ask ourselves the question, is the problem really with the community? Am I, am I really being shut out by everyone? Or is the problem maybe that I have a contentment problem? And maybe the one truly hindering community right now is me. Those are three hindrances to community. The last thing I want us to look at this morning is three pictures of true community. Three pictures of true community. And these last few verses are interesting and they'll likely be familiar to you if you've ever been to a wedding ceremony before because they're very often read, particularly at Christian weddings, to describe in more detail what God said succinctly in Genesis 2.18. It is not good for man to be alone. What I'd like to suggest to you this morning, while these verses certainly do include the beauty of community that's experienced within a marriage, to limit them to only describing that would be a great mistake. I say that particularly to those of you who are single here this morning, because all too often in our churches, we can lift up the beauty of marriage to a place that makes anyone who's not married or who can't get married, feel like they're on some kind of lower level, some second class in the family of God. And that's just not the case. It's not the case. Because, listen, marriage is absolutely, it's one of God's good gifts to us in this life, but it's not the pinnacle of all relationships. It's not. A relationship with Jesus is. That's the pinnacle. And when we forget that, we get caught up in saying all kinds of romantic-sounding stuff that actually has no basis in the Bible. So, what we don't have here is solely a description of marriage relationship, but what we absolutely do have in these closing verses of our passage is three pictures, three examples of what true community looks like, as well as a description of the blessings that come when we live according to our relational design. And the three pictures I see Solomon giving us here are these, accountability, affection, and then advocacy. Accountability, affection, advocacy. So Solomon gives something kind of like a thesis statement there in verse 9. Look with me there. He says, two are better than one because they have good return for their work. So he's setting up his demonstration of these three pictures of true community. Good return there in verse 9. It's just the same as to say they earn superior wages. Uh, that They complete their work with greater profit and likely with greater efficiency than someone could do just working on their own. It's a principle that's often summed up by the well-known proverb, many hands make light work. And the first blessing, the first advantage of community that Solomon lists here, we see in verse 10. Look there. He says, if one falls down, his friend can help him up. 
but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Now, yes, there's an obvious description of rescue going on here, right? Someone's fallen, helping him up. But unless you're someone here this morning who's especially frail, maybe especially clumsy, I don't know, maybe you're learning to snowboard, I don't know all that many people that literally fall down all that much, that need someone to help them up again. Maybe you do, I, I don't. But I do know people that fall. I know people that get knocked down by the trials of life, people that get knocked down by temptations to sin all the time. I know lots of people like that. That's everybody I know. And in light of that truth, I think this first picture of true community that Solomon gives us here is one of accountability. Accountability of having someone there to help us up, to to call us back, to, to pick us up and pull us out whenever we fall. Whenever we are overcome by those trials or temptations in life. Because, of course, one of the most destructive attitudes in any community is hiding our failures. Hiding our our fallings and telling ourselves, well, I can get out of this. I can just get out of this on my own. I don't need to share with anybody. I'll just fix it on my own. But having others around us who will commit to help us up, to put out their hand and be like, let me help you. Let me walk alongside you. Whenever we have that in front of us and with us, it's the first picture of community that Solomon says brings good return for our work. It brings good return when we have that accountability of someone to walk with us, to help us up. Next picture is in verse 11. Look with me there. Solomon says, Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm? Warm alone. Now, yes, clearly this has implications within a marriage relationship. Okay, it's not wrong here to picture a nice spooning snuggle on a a cold evening or something like that. No, that is good and right. And yet, any of you who have ever trained in wilderness survival, any of you who are trained as lifeguards, you you will know that there's an understanding there that shared body heat in an emergency situation can mean the, the difference between life or death. You're waiting in the ocean to get rescued. You need shared body heat in order to do that and not die of hypothermia. Or to come across somebody who's experiencing hypothermia, but you can't get them into a place of warmth right away. Shared body heat is one of the ways you rescue them. Just consider alone the life-giving warmth that an affectionate community can offer us in a world that is all too often cold, an isolating place to live in. We need the shared warmth of community. Finally, the last picture Solomon gives us of true community is advocacy. Advocacy. You see this in verse 12. Solomon says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not Quickly broken. Now that last part of verse 12 in particular has been given all kinds of interpretations and understandings, picturing a, a trinity, they say. They say it pictures uh, how God holds a married couple together. It's the third chord. It talks about, some people say it's uh, bringing kids, how they bring stability into a family relationship, all those things. And I think all those pictures could make use of that analogy. But big picture, do you know what Solomon is trying to communicate with that statement? He's trying to say that a cord of three strands is really hard to break. That it's as simple as that. It's, it's hard to break. That there is a, a strength, a greater strength in numbers that we don't have on our own. Whether the battle is physical, spiritual, uh, political, psychological, whatever it is that threatens to overpower us, how comforting does it feel to know you have a community of brothers and sisters battling alongside you, advocating for you. To know that whatever opposition you face in this life does not have to be faced alone. It's funny to think about, but I think one of the reasons we read verses 9 through 12, whether you're a Christian or not here this morning, we find ourselves nodding our heads in agreement or even just saying, well, of course that's better. Of course that's better. The reason is because what Solomon's describing here is a life lived out in accordance with God's intended design of us. It, make, it just feels right. Same way that a fish who, who flops out of the net and manages to get back into the ocean, a minute later he looks around and he's like, 
Oh, this is better. This feels way better than up in that net. This feels right. Or, or, or driving on the right side of the road feels much less stressful than constantly having to weave in and out of oncoming cars. It feels right because it was designed that way. Solomon's pictures of true community feel right. They sound right to us because they are right. Because they're in accordance with the way God designed us in the first place. Or as Philip Reichen says in his book on Ecclesiastes, the buddy system is not just for school field trips and swimming in the ocean. It's God's plan for our life and service to him. It has been this way from the beginning. My question for you as it relates to all that Solomon just described here is, are you living in accordance with that design? Are you making use of the community that God's put around you, even amongst this church family. There's lots of opportunities for community. Are you making use of them? It's all well and good to nod our heads in agreement with what Solomon pictures here, but are you actually making yourself accountable to other people in this church who know and love you? Are you receiving and returning the warmth of community that each of us needs so desperately in this world? Are you admitting your need for others to stand beside you? And are you standing beside others as they reveal their need to you? This, that, that's what we were designed for. That's the way God set up things to work. So it begs the question, why are you still trying to put on a brave face and act like you don't need anyone? Why are you still planning to, to one day get more connected when you're in desperate need of connection and community right now? Why are you still watching someone on the brink of falling and thinking, man, someone should really do something to help them? Why do we do that? Just like the fish out of water, living outside of God's intended design is suffocating to the human soul. And believing that somehow you're the one exception to the rule will only leave you chasing after the wind. It's not how you were designed. It doesn't work that way. In the end, the question that haunts me most of all is, why? Why? Uh, if I'm designed to be relational because I'm made in the image of likeness of a, of a relational God, and if the benefits of community are plainly obvious to me, why do I still find myself so often on the outside of community? Why is that? Or, or, or why do I know my need for community but still find myself being one of the hindrances to it? Why does that happen? Well, there's all kinds of good reasons for that to happen. The most basic one being that since the entry of sin into the world, our desires are now disordered. Disordered. We don't walk in accordance with our design that God made us with. That's the first easy reason. Another reason very likely could be maybe you are doing everything right, actually, but community takes a group of people to do, and maybe others are not operating according to their design. But beyond that, I think another reason we don't regularly engage in community is because whether explicitly we know or instinctively we know, being in community involves a cost. It involves a cost, and it's a cost very often we don't want to pay. I don't want to. Commenting on our passage, Derek Kidner said this, such demands here are not explicit but there would hardly be the need to set out the benefits of partnership if it involved no cost. Its obvious price, the obvious price of community is a person's independence. That is the cost. Henceforth, he must consult another's interest and convenience. He must listen to another's reasoning, adjust to another's pace and style, keep faith with another's trust. I think in the end, the reality is that we so often live outside of community and act in ways that hinder it because we're not willing to pay the price to have it. We don't want to give up that independence. We want all the benefits of community without having to contribute to it ourselves. <coughs> Pastor and author Tim Keller said it this way, everyone says they want community and friendship, but mention accountability and commitment, and they run the other way. 
think that's true. But we dare not run away from the cost. We dare not run away because along with community with one another, the Bible is also clear that we were designed for community with God. We were designed for community with Him, both so that we could know the joy of a restored relationship with Him and so that we could gradually reflect more and more of His image and likeness as we have that community with Him. That's what Paul said in Romans 8.29, that the purpose of God saving us was so that we might be conformed more and more into the image of His Son. That's what community with God is about, to make us look more like Jesus. But, aha, that's where community with one another suddenly becomes even more important because just like those Ikea bunk beds, <laughs> this work was not intended to be completed on our own. The, the, the lifelong task of looking more and more like Jesus is not a task you can complete on your own. We need each other. The Bible is full of commands, of one another commands, of ways we need to work together in community to do this. Tim Keller again says it this way so well. Only if you are part of a community of believers seeking to resemble, serve, and love Jesus will you ever get to know him and grow in his likeness. It means we need each other. And beyond that even, when we remember that the God of the universe was willing to pay the cost of his own son in order to restore relationship and community with us, is there truly any cost that's not worth paying to be in that community both with each other and with the God who created you and designed you to be in community? There is a cost. There is a cost to community and enjoying the benefits of life together. Absolutely there is. But there's also very good return for that investment, both for yourself as well as for those with whom you do life together with. But we'll never do this on our own either, so let's pray now. Ask God to help us as we seek to be that community, knowing and loving each other.